So 50 years ago, in July, we will mark the anniversary of the first time man set foot on the moon. One of the many achievements that we've accomplished over the last century. This past year, France detected and captured a quake on Mars and recorded the audio. That's fascinating in the fact that we are curious to understand what's going on in the worlds around us. That's the power of curiosity that propels us forward around Earth, of course, and in space. So CNES Mars is a great example of how we are curious beings. So if you think back to the Mars landing, a vast number of engineers, mathematicians, physicists, laborers, all worked on one project. They were hired for two traits, curiosity and capability. They needed to be experts in their field, of course. They had to be capable. They also needed to be curious. They were about to do something that's never been done before. They had to challenge their own assumptions. They had to challenge each other and then accomplish something very unique. So you could argue that curiosity and capability are part of SAS. And why do I say that? Well, our founder and CEO, Dr. Jim Goodnight, was one of those 400,000 workers on that mission to the moon. It helped him and many others invest in data and analytics and science and discovery. It also helped, gave us a lot of inventions that we'll talk about shortly. So clearly, it's a big feat to get to the moon. It led to a lot of remarkable discoveries. Uh, most likely, we would not have laptops if we hadn't had the moon vision. Most likely, we would not have digital photography if we didn't embark on that discovery. And you can see some other examples here as well. So that milestone really precipitated more advances in technology. That was 50 years ago. We're not here to talk about the past so much, but there are stunning parallels with today and the future. Math, computing power, connectivity, and automation. All were prevalent then, and I submit that they are all very prevalent now. Today, to, today we have an explosion of data. We're all connected, all of us. Our homes are connected, our cars, our stores, and we have machine learning and automation now entering the world and really driving efficiency. Machines can now see they can drive cars, they can see defects in the plants, they can help us navigate our daily lives. So as much as there was a space race 50 years ago, we see ourselves in a similar race today. How do we leverage technology to solve problems that could not be solved yesterday or the day before? So now, all the computing power that sent a man to the moon, we carry in our pockets. So why don't we take advantage of that? And I think we should. So over the next few minutes, <clears throat> I'd like to step back and take a look at technology forces. And there are several that we feel very confident in that, that have affected technology and will continue to do so. And then I would like to apply that framework to analytics. I believe they're very similar, and hopefully you'll see that in, in the next few minutes. And then I would also like to share some of those stories of you. Some of the customers in the marketplace, what are they doing to drive innovation and apply artificial intelligence to drive their businesses and services forward? So first, let's talk about what is technology. I know it's an interesting question. Hopefully we all have a good perspective of it. It's not just tools and gadgets. I would submit that technology is pretty much everything we do. Money, Writing, countries and borders, navigation, and of course, all of our gadgets and our screens and uh, all the technology in our lives. We invent things to extend human capability. 
That's what we do. That's what we do. We invent things to extend human capability. So when we reflect on these forces, and I would submit these four forces, this is what's ultimately driving technology. First is connectivity. It increases the flow of goods and services. The second is digitization, which is clearly driving, and we're in the midst of a digital transformation. The third is automation, and the fourth, artificial intelligence. We've always used automation, and now we enter artificial intelligence to add to that, and we'll talk quite a bit about that. None of these forces are new. So if you think back, connectivity goes back to roads, which we're all glad we're not on this morning, or glad we're here. Um, waterways, navigation paths. Now we're all connected through the air. Our homes, our cars, our people, our friends, our buildings. So connectivity is not new. Automation has always been around to improve efficiency, operations, uh, quality of service. And we're still very automated. We're not completely replacing humans like you saw in the opening video. We're augmenting humans. So the automation is really part of the way of the world as opposed to a dramatic change. We're also applying math and algorithms to help us with that automation, all based on data, all based on data. So it's useful to think about technology in these four uh, terms, and they are organizing principles, as Kevin Kelly described them. They are organizing principles to allow technology to get what it wants, and it will get what it wants. And I'll share with you some examples to prove that point. Technology wants to reorganize. It becomes accessible. As it becomes accessible, it needs to be distributed. And once distributed, abundance has arrived. And there are different stages of that, but those, those terms and those forces are really driving technology. Technology resembles the form that it's replacing first. And what do I mean by that? It re resembles the medium that it's replacing. Here's a great example. Any guesses of what this is? It's the first car. Gottlieb Daimler in 1886 invented this automobile. Now, what does it look like to you? Maybe a horse-drawn carriage without the horse. Exactly. It resembles the medium that it's trying to replace. Now, there's a motor in there, and Mr. Daimler said, hmm, there's probably a market for 5,000 of these because he couldn't think beyond training more than 5,000 chauffeurs. He never thought that we would drive our own cars. Today, as technology has reorganized, cars are slightly different. Clearly, we drive them, or in this case, this car can drive itself. As we know, there's a lot of advances in technology being applied to automation and what we would call normal operating models in our society. This is no longer a horse-drawn carriage, nor does it resemble one. And there are many other examples like this. One, for example, is AI. When we first talk about AI and artificial intelligence, sometimes we think about Technology replacing the medium, meaning humans. So is AI all about this inquisitive robot doing a puzzle? Maybe in the movies. But this really is not what artificial intelligence is about. Technology in this case really has evolved to automation and artificial intelligence, not replacing the human, but actually being embedded in the devices, embedded in the processes, embedded in the ways that we operate and navigate the world. Back to the car. Artificial intelligence in the car is not a robot sitting in the driver's seat driving us to work and home. Artificial intelligence is the, in the car is the car itself is smart and we ride in it or drive it. 
That's the evolution and the force of technology and artificial intelligence at play. The success of a technology increases as it becomes more accessible. As it becomes more accessible, it becomes more easily distributed and more abundant. And as it becomes more abundant, of course, it becomes a commodity. Does that mean it's not worth as much anymore? No. Still very valuable, but abundance means a commodity. And we see this in computing, for example. Mainframes, minis, PCs, laptops, phones, edge computing devices, all becoming more and more and more abundant, somewhat commoditized, but still very valuable. Thomas J. Watson, the CEO of IBM many, many years ago, said there is a world market for maybe five computers. Five computers. Unfortunately, that prediction was wrong. During the forum today, there'll be 18,000 or 1,800 of us here. We all have a computer in our pocket for sure. Some of us have two. So clearly, there's a market for way more than five. But Mr. Watson didn't envision how technology would reorganize and become more accessible and grow in abundance. The, the state of computing and the distribution of computing has changed dramatically from day one when the mainframes were invented. So access to that technology prevails over ownership. And I'll talk a little bit about that. In today's technology world, software as a service, cloud computing, function as a service, is very similar to how technology evolves. We can access it. We can pay for it. We don't have to own it. It's evolving, we leverage it, we incorporate that into our business, but we have tremendous access to it, but we don't have to own it. Technology will get what it wants by going through these forces. It absolutely will get what it, what it wants. As Kevin Kelly said, it is simply inevitable. So as humans, we are explorers, we are innovators, we seek the unknown, we live in a world in a time of zettabytes of data. Zettabytes of data. Petabytes are no longer the topic. So now is the time for us to see what happens when curiosity meets capability. Today our moon mission is to take that data and put it into action for our businesses. To make those intelligent decisions. To drive our organizations and drive our society forward. So we need to use data to chart a new path forward. At SAS, this is our vision, to transform a world of data into a world of intelligence. We believe we can do that, and I mean we can do that with analytics. It's a very audacious goal. And why do I say that? Because 5% of the available data can be analyzed. That means 95% of all the data out there right now is not accessible to analytics and analyzing and optimizing. So we need to understand more of that data. We need to uncover those trends and not only access that data, but apply the analysis to it. But fundamentally, we believe this vision can manifest itself. Analytics itself is transformative. Analytics itself changes. So what makes analytics work? Algorithms. At the core, that is the work unit of all analytics are algorithms. What's an algorithm? It really is a recipe. It's a recipe for, a mathematical recipe for making one thing work with another thing and ultimately an outcome. Today, very different than 50 years ago with the moon mission, algorithms are actually constructed and built very differently and applied very differently. And now bring in automation. So automation with analytics doesn't just say what happened. Tell me how you did that. It actually is more of help me understand the data or give me more data so 
I can learn from that and make a better decision, recommendation, or suggestion. So if we accept that analytics is technology, we should expect analytics to constantly be changing, becoming more and more and more abundant and more and more distributed, just like the forces on technology. And analytics will ultimately get what it, what it wants. So technology has its forces and its evolution. Analytics being part of and a consumer of the technology is continuously reorganizing. So we've seen batch processing. We've seen real-time processing. Now we have edge processing. So the whole concept of analytics has evolved and reorganized. Uh, it's clearly becoming more accessible. It is more available uh, to all of us and not just the PhD in science, in math, in, in physics. It has to become more accessible, as do, do the results. So a summarization, a prediction, an output, all become more and more accessible and more and more abundant. So last year, the theme of our conference was the analytics economy. And an analytics economy is data-driven. Just like any economy, it has resources, it has outputs, and it has actors and players in the economy. Cloud computing and analytics has clearly driven this new economy, allowing analytics to get what it wants. Now are we done? Are we there yet? Has everything been finished and we can go home? No. We're not quite there, but we are at a very pivotal moment in history where analytics is prevalent, it's expected, and it's evolving very rapidly, much like technology. Firstly, data is everywhere. We know that. We've seen that. 95% of it we can't even access. Embedding analytics, simplifying analytics, creating visualization and automation is also very prevalent. We've become that much better in life. We have now become much better photographers and videographers because we own a smartphone. But because I own an iPhone does not make me Platon, does not make me Steven Spielberg. It does allow me to produce and consume. And I would submit <clears throat> there's a new persona in our world, and it's us, called the prosumer. One who produces and consumes all because of the abundance of technology. It's in our hand, it's in our car, it's in our home. So this concept of a prosumer allows us to exist this way because of technology and the abundance of technology. So data science is becoming more and more no-code data science, citizen data scientists, analytic platforms that allow the embedding and the integration of multiple models and multiple techniques to solve a business problem. Always where analytics follows the data. Many years ago, we moved analytics to the data if it was in database or in memory. We do that now by moving it out to the edge. We will always have analytics as close as possible to the data and the decision point. We should push to the edge device. These devices are generating more and more data, as we saw, than we can possibly analyze. So we have to be smarter about analyzing that and modeling that. For us to accomplish this vision, to transform the world of data into a world of intelligence, we believe analytics needs to be brought to everyone, everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. Everyone means all of us from the data scientist to the IT manager, the data architect, the executive, and the business analyst. Everyone. To do that, we need fit-to-purpose interfaces, the interface that allows us to operate and consume, whether that's on our laptop or our phone or a kiosk. We also need automation. Automation does not mean step away and let things happen for us. Not at all. Automation means engage appropriately and also allow us, as things automate, to interpret what's going on. 
We at SAS have never believed in black box analytics. We believe in automation. We know that automation helps you progress. We don't believe in black box. You should be able to understand what is going on. You must be able to adjust it and tweak it for your competitive advantage. That is fundamental to the belief we have on analytics evolving your business. Everywhere means just that. All of your technology environments, not just one section of your data center. Your cloud, whether it's public or private. The edge devices through APIs in your operational systems and your equipment and your manufacturing equipment. Why do we care about everywhere? Because data without analytics is value not realized. Data without analytics is value not realized. That's why we believe analytics should be everywhere. So what are we at SAS doing about this? I want to share a, a little bit of our time Today, and obviously here at the forum, you're not only going to hear about what SAS is doing, you're going to hear about what you are doing. A lot of your colleagues are sharing their successes, they're sharing their innovations, and they're sharing their questions because they too are curious about what to do next. So as technology evolves, music has become very liquid. So I have in my pocket hours upon hours of music for flights and relaxing in the hotel room, uh, and traveling in cars. I also love to go to concerts. An evening concert with my family, enjoying the summer. Is that the version of Batch? Because it's a concert that I can only see that once? No, they're just different forms of the same technology and the same medium. I get to choose as do you get to choose. We believe that choice is fundamental and that choice is now ours. So you, as you sit here today and start the forum, please feel empowered that you have choices. You have choices of data warehouses and data lakes, private cloud and public cloud, edge computing, serverless architectures. How do I do explicit or implicit algorithms? Those are all choices. How do I train domain experts to become more data scientists? How do I train data scientists to understand my business? So we all have the challenge of choices. Analytics, and more specifically, artificial intelligence is going to allow us to transform our businesses. So there's no shortage of examples of how artificial intelligence is being applied. Serge, is this your phone? Has this ever happened to you? Yes. Has this ever happened to anybody in the audience? Of course it has, because a company here in Paris called Back Market was just featured in Fast Company, one of the top innovative companies of 2019. What do they do? They use machine learning and artificial intelligence to match buyers with sellers of refurbished hardware. They use artificial intelligence to understand demand and flow. And they're named one of the most innovative companies on earth for helping us all get a shiny new device that isn't cracked and you can read your emails. I would also submit there are other organizations that you all know very well. Volvo, for example, is putting analytics and sensors in over 175,000 trucks as they move goods and services around the continent. Roulet Coli uses VA, visual analytics from SAS, to manage and optimize over 40 billion packages that it delivers each year, 40 billion. So now we're talking about scale. And Agria uses SAS for better care of pets and obviously peace of mind of the families. And CHU Montpellier uses SAS for not only improving patient care and outcomes, but also the research side of the business. So both research 
and the clinical aspects to make our lives safer and more comfortable. But progress feels a little slow. And that's some of the challenge that we see. I had the pleasure of joining some folks last evening and we talked a little bit about this artificial intelligence feeling a little behind. There's so much going on. Well, there's a lot of talk and we at SAS want to make sure you know that artificial intelligence is real. And we're doing that by helping you see these breakthroughs. And we want to be very, very clear about what's working and what's evolving and what we can do next. To do that, we want to solve these challenges. And here are four challenges that I believe fundamentally we all need to address to make AI work for us, artificial intelligence working for us. First one is solve problems at scale. 175,000 trucks, 40 billion deliveries a year. That's scale. That's using artificial intelligence at scale. Demand forecasting for an individual product or an individual store or an individual warehouse. A good use of analytics. Doing that for thousands of stores and hundreds of distribution centers like Carrefour uses. That's at scale. Extending and hardening the analytic ecosystem. So this is where different tools, technologies, and techniques all come into play. Clearly at SAS, we have a large portfolio of technology and solutions, and we love and appreciate that you use that. We also know that there are other technologies that you need and rely on. And therefore, from our standpoint, we have to be a critical part of that ecosystem and fit into that ecosystem with SaaS and open source and other technologies. That's what extending and hardening the ecosystem is about. The other challenge is, do you feel stuck in a science project? The science project being, this is pretty cool. I did a proof of concept. It looked good, but I didn't get it into production. So you're therefore not getting the value. So a lot of these, the, these proof of concepts are lacking the strategy to productionalize it and make it hardened and running full time. Therefore, you have to scale those analytics into an environment that allows you to deploy and orchestrate. There's also a user imbalance. Resources may have too much science, not enough business, too much business, not enough science, and we have to balance that. So that is a challenge. We should make it easier. It's not going to be easy, but we do want to make it easier. And these are five core principles that SAS believes will help make it easier. One is a flexible user experience. Not just the interface, but the experience so that everyone can access analytics appropriately and they can access that everywhere. We want to empower teams all across the organization. Openness and integration means fitting into those environments those complex environments. It means being part of a complex system through APIs and interfaces that allow all software to fit together, work together, and change rapidly. That's what's key about openness and integration. Learning and automation sometimes is seen as man versus machine, and it really isn't, and it really shouldn't be. It should be more of a yin and yang between artificial intelligence and the powering of humans. We at SAS believe artificial intelligence is really about enabling our human capacity. So much so that we believe in humans to the power of AI. That's our message out to the market. Not that AI is coming to take over. AI will augment, AI will um, automate, but it's not going to take over. Digital guardianship is a fourth one, and really there, there's security, privacy, governance, very important aspects that we see each and every day. I would also submit that the management of analytical assets is underserved today. We see that at SAS, we're taking action on it, and we see that as we, we work with clients and partners in the market. 
the management of analytical assets is underserved today. Therefore, we need to do a better job of governance. We need to do a better job of innovation around analytics. And the last one here is analytics orchestration. How do you take all of that work and deliver that into production? How do you take all of that capability and make it real? And therefore, you have a balance of all the choice of techniques and the control and the management that you put in place. We know, for, for example, we wake up each morning, we push a button, and electricity pops on. It's that easy, right? We push the button, and everything shows up for us. We flip the switch. Well, maybe it's not quite that easy. There are thousands of kilometers of power lines that need to be managed regularly, especially managed so that vegetation doesn't intrude. So we are partnering with a large manufacturer of drone equipment. And this manufacturer uses drones to fly the lines, you know, thousands upon thousands of kilometers of lines, take images, and really understand, as you can see here, what are the patterns of vegetation growth. Some is growing faster than others. Some may be encroaching on the right of way. And therefore, send a crew to the area that needs to be serviced versus having humans drive those lines or even fly those lines, and that takes time and money. In this case, allow the drones with computer vision and analytics at the edge to do a bit of work for us and help us optimize where to take our crews and where to best um, utilize our resources. So this is the kind of innovation that we can see where AI augments human capability, and advances business. So you can see how partnering with a large manufacturer and, and embedding computer vision and really bringing artificial intelligence to life and making it real drives business value. We at SAS believe we should embed AI into applications. We believe that we should embed AI into the tools and technologies while still developing human expertise. And we invest a lot of our energy and our resources in education and development. So I hope that these examples help illustrate how we are seeing and using the lens of technology and artificial intelligence and how technology and analytics are all affected by these forces of change. And more importantly, how is analytics being real? So every one of us has a moon mission. We all have a challenge this morning, today, tomorrow, to embark on making more intelligent decisions by leveraging curiosity that we all have and the capability that we not only have but will have. So we are committed to transform that world and I suspect because you are here investing your time, you too are committed. So I welcome you on that journey. I thank you for your time this morning. And I do hope you have a fantastic conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, thank well. you.